live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. One of the great things about standings is that they never lie. The standings are a display in order of winning percentage from top to bottom of how every team in a particular conference is lined up. If there's a team that's 4-1, they're going to be, in the standings, above a team that's sitting at 3-2. and two. Now you can argue who the better team is actually, and dive into a whole bunch of metrics, and the rankings might say a different story. But the standings are one of the few parts of college football that is not arbitrary. If Team A has a higher winning percentage than Team B, then Team A is above them in the standings. No questions asked. But now, I want you to imagine that after this past season, after Ohio State lost to Michigan, that a bunch of Ohio State fans wrote to ESPN and their local newspapers and to online media outlets and demanded that they place Ohio State above Michigan in the standings. That wouldn't seem to make a whole lot of sense now, would it? Michigan owns the tiebreaker over Ohio State via the head-to-head -head metric, so by default, Michigan is above Ohio State in the standings. Seems very obvious, and why any fan would try and say that the standings were fake is absolutely absurd. Now, nothing like that happened with Ohio State and Michigan this past season, obviously. But you might be surprised to find out that this somewhat insane hypothetical, believe it or not, actually happened. Because in 1985, there was a bizarre controversy in the SEC involving Florida, Tennessee, and some newspapers in Knoxville, where fans campaigned, and to an extent, actually got what they wanted, where they encouraged their media to lie to them and say that Tennessee was in first place, even when, by literally every account, they weren't. In 1985, the year of Springsteen and Madonna, and way before Nirvana, there was U2 and Blondie and Chaos down in Tennessee. And this is the story behind that. Before I talk about the actual media request in question, because it is a weird one, we need some context to understand how the SEC was playing out and how Florida was ahead of Tennessee in the standings in the first place. To start off the 1985 season, it was apparent that this was going to be a special season for the Volunteers. It had been a rough period for Tennessee football lately. They hadn't finished ranked inside the top 20 of the AP poll since 1974, and they hadn't won the SEC since 1969. But something about this year's team, led by the legendary head coach Johnny Majors, was different. Thanks to a great defense, spearheaded in the secondary by Chris White, who wound up finishing the 1985 season with an NCAA best 9 interceptions, and thanks to a solid offense with the best receiver in the SEC in Tim McGee, who led the conference in receptions and receiving yards that year, one year after finishing second in that category, the Volunteers were looking incredible, and were looking like one of the best teams in the country. They tied UCLA, the number 10 team in the nation, then defeated a number one ranked Auburn team by three possessions, winning 38-20 and went on the road to defeat a ranked Alabama team down at Legion Field. Back then, conference scheduling was a bit weird, as in the SEC, you only had six conference games, meaning that about half of your schedule was comprised of non-conference play. But it was apparent that this Tennessee team was different. The gauntlet of the schedule in conference play was done. The final three conference games that Tennessee had left were against three unranked teams who were arguably the worst teams in the conference, in Ole Miss, Kentucky, and Vanderbilt, and two of these games were at home. In other words, barring a complete collapse or a stunning upset, not only was Tennessee going to finish this SEC season with five wins, but they were going to have a real shot at winning the conference for the first time in over a decade and a half. There was just one small problem, and that, as you might have been able to guess, was this team right here. Because in conference play, there was one game that Tennessee lost and there was one game that may have done them in for a shot at the national championship. That was the battle down at Florida Field against the number 7 ranked Florida Gators, a game which the Gators won by a final score of 17-10. It was a back and forth affair and a real defensive battle, with the two unbeaten teams being tied 3-all at the halftime break. But two touchdown runs by Neil Anderson in the second half made the difference, and kept Florida's unbeaten season alive. Obviously, with Florida having no losses, and Tennessee having one loss, Florida was above Tennessee in the standings. That is what we call common sense. That's how math works. That's how numbers work. That's how the laws of sport work. Florida was an incredible team, 
and entering mid-November, had yet to lose a game. They were 4-0 in conference play. Their lone blemish was a tie game at home against Rutgers of all teams, and they were the number one ranked team in the country. They were two games away from an undefeated season in the SEC and a conference title. But not all winning streaks can last forever. Because on November 9th, 1985, when Florida played Georgia at the Gator Bowl, an 18-game unbeaten streak dating back to 1984 came to an end. In what might be one of the most surprising results in the history of the Florida-Georgia rivalry, simply because of how dominant the performance was, Georgia defeated Florida by a final score of 24-3. For the first time ever, Florida was the number one ranked team in the country. That was incredibly short-lived, to say the least. Georgia picked up 344 rushing yards, with multiple players on the Bulldogs, Keith Henderson and Tim Worley, slicing and dicing their way through Florida's usually great defense with over 100 yards rushing. Henderson had 145 rushing yards on 9 carries, which is an unbelievable average of 16.1 yards per carry, and Worley had 104 rushing yards on 7 carries, picking up 14.9 yards per carry. With numbers like that, yeah, it's not hard to see why Florida lost this game, and why Georgia was in complete control. And with this loss, it meant that Florida and Tennessee were now level in the standings, with both Florida and Tennessee each having one loss. Now, in a normal world, this doesn't change anything. Florida is still ahead of Tennessee because Florida owns the head-to-head -head tie break. But this is 1985 that we're talking about. And in 1985, complicating the matter even further, Florida was ineligible for postseason play. In 1984, the NCAA put Florida on probation for three years for violating NCAA rules. Over the course of 22 months from December 1982 until the NCAA announced its ruling in October 1984, it was reported that Florida committed a whopping 107 rules violations, including but not limited to improper cash payments and illegal scouting activities. The scandal rocked college football and cost head coach Charlie Pell his job in the middle of the season. But this meant that no matter how the team was performing under head coach Galen Hall, that they would not be eligible to make a bowl game, win the SEC, or represent the SEC in the Sugar Bowl. Why does all this matter? because someone had to represent the SEC in the Sugar Bowl, and based on how the bowl tie-ins worked back then, the winner of the SEC would play in that game. That was the most prestigious bowl game, and when you played in the SEC, your goal was always to make it down to New Orleans on New Year's Day. And even if Florida was in first place, they wouldn't even be eligible to win the SEC title. Even their 1984 title, which they originally won by going 5-0-1 in conference play, was vacated. So that's how serious their probation was. That is to say, to make a long story short, if everything held and Florida couldn't represent the conference, then it would be Tennessee who would get to do it. Now, if Florida beat Georgia and finished undefeated in conference play, it would definitely be a bit weird to have Tennessee representing the SEC in the Sugar Bowl as the de facto conference champions. They'd be in the game on a technicality. Not to take anything away from their great season, but they didn't technically win the title. They only won it because the first place team got disqualified and was being punished for the actions of a coach that wasn't even there anymore. But now that Florida lost to Georgia and Florida and Tennessee were on equal footing, it made things significantly easier to accept. Take it from wide receiver Tim McGee, who said on Florida's loss to Georgia, this is great for us mentally. Even if we go to the Sugar Bowl, if Florida had won all its games, it would be hard for us to say we were the best. Now, we have a chance to tie for the title outright. McGee said from day one that the idea of being the champion by coming in second place did not sit well with him whatsoever. But now that Tennessee and Florida were tied for first, with Florida not even being eligible for the title or the Sugar Bowl bid, Tennessee had an idea. What if we just tinkered the standings a teeny tiny bit? What if we took Florida and pushed them somewhere else? And what followed was an absolutely bizarre controversy in the media. In 1985, there were two local papers in Knoxville, Tennessee. You had the morning paper, the Knoxville News Sentinel, and you had the afternoon paper, the Knoxville Journal. Each edition in the sports section, they would list the standings in the SEC, as you would expect a local paper to do. And both papers had completely factual, accurate, and 100% truthful standings to showcase how things lined up in the SEC. But then, Florida lost to Georgia, and petitions started flying around. Fans requested 
petitioned, and demanded that the newspapers adjust their standings, not just to show that Tennessee was above Florida, but to move Florida to the bottom of the standings, period. Show Florida as a last place team. They're not eligible to win the conference, so why even list them? Show Tennessee as the only team with one loss in the conference, put them in first place, and put Florida down in last place. In other words, let's encourage our media outlets and newspapers to lie. Now, if this was just a few crazy fans who wrote a petition, this would be a complete non-story. People do crazy things for their team all the time, and if that was the criteria, then this whole channel would be nothing but breaking down and criticizing asinine comments made on message boards. But it was not that. There were multiple officials from within the Tennessee Volunteers organization that were spearheading the movement, including Bud Ford and Haywood Harris. And I don't mean that they signed their name to a piece of paper. They physically took time out of their days to call both newspapers and push for this change. Not only was there fan pressure, but the fan pressure was being spearheaded by Tennessee itself. The actual Tennessee Volunteers football team and athletic department was actively leading a campaign to get these newspapers to lie. And now, both the Knoxville Journal and the Knoxville News Sentinel were in no-win situations. If you don't appease the demands of Tennessee's fans and athletic department, then you're going to receive a ton of backlash, maybe lose business, and maybe lose access to inside information. If you do appease their demands, then you're literally breaking the number one rule of journalism by spreading falsehoods. So what did the papers decide to do? To make this story even more bizarre, the two papers did two completely different things. The morning paper, the Knoxville News Sentinel, declined wholeheartedly and said that this entire thing was stupid and defeated the entire purpose of, you know, having standings. As the paper said, the purpose of standings is to rank teams by number of wins. If we could just pick and choose where we want to place teams in the standings, then why even have standings? Plus, we can already do that with rankings. The Knoxville News Sentinel said that they were not going to lie and deceive their readers. But the Knoxville Journal? Yeah, they had no problem with this. They happily abided and decided to put Florida at the bottom of the standings, giving Tennessee sole possession of first place. You thought Captain America vs. Iron Man was the real Civil War? Nope. It was the civil war taking place in Knoxville between the new Sentinel, who stuck to journalistic integrity and values, and the Journal, who decided to appease Tennessee's athletic department and fan base. And for what it's worth, Tennessee wound up winning the SEC, running the table the rest of the way by predictably destroying their final three opponents in Ole Miss, Kentucky, and Vanderbilt, outscoring them by a combined score of 106-14, with the final two games being shutouts. It was complete domination. Then, they played Miami in the Sugar Bowl, won that game 35-7 to win their first Sugar Bowl since 1970, and they finished the season ranked number 4 in the AP Bowl, capping off one of the best seasons in program history with a bang. But as wild as Tennessee's season was on the field in 1985, for all the right reasons, it was just as wild off the field for some bizarre reasons. Because in 1985, in this bizarre battle between Tennessee's fans, Tennessee's athletic department, the morning paper in Knoxville, and the afternoon paper in Knoxville, we were taught an extremely bizarre lesson that sometimes the standings, the most objective thing in the world that are extremely easy to understand and calculate, can lie. The saying numbers never lie was proven wrong on this day. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com. And be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.